Well, I've been waiting for this renewal. Every time I get these guys lined up and booked, it's almost like, you know, I get to know them first, you know, because I get to write them down. Holy Spirit tells me who. And, and uh, then it's almost like I, I anticipate it and I'm just excited about it. And then when I get confirmation that they can come, then I share it with you. So it's been several months now that we've been knowing they were coming. Now, John, here's how I got John. John came, and I don't even know John, um, but John came and did Kella's wedding, Kella Jackson's wedding, and if you were here, it was, did a fantastic job. I love the way you did her wedding. Then I went and looked you up online. I looked at all, uh, your track record, your prison record, <laughs> post office pictures, whatever I could find. It was, it was huge. No, I thought this, here's, here's what, I, I loved how you preach. But one thing is, Kella stayed at your house for four years with you and your wife, right? Not that long? No, it's about 15 months. Okay, so, well, Fred lied then. Okay, so I can't believe anything Fred Jackson said. It seemed that long to Fred. But uh, I thought, well, if Fred, Fred trusts his daughter, his baby girl, with them, then they got to be conservative and love the Lord because he's not going to let his daughter go stay with anybody. And he talked very highly of you. And she talked highly of the church and how you ministered at that church. And I thought that would be a great fit to end our, our revival night on a Wednesday night. So, brother, come on up and share with us. We, uh, we've been praying over you ever since we started. And you said yes. That's good. Y'all had him how long? What did she say? He's almost housebroken. I love it. I like the fact that it's almost housebroken. Yeah, I was here back in June and got to meet Brother Thomas that afternoon. And uh, it was a hot afternoon in June. And we did Kella's wedding. We, uh, Kella is, uh, we, she's like an adopted daughter to us. Uh, she was already very close to our family. And uh, through a set of circumstances came to live with us for um, I was saying 18 months. The, my family kept telling us more like 15 or 16 months. But either way, we, we love Kella very much. She became like part of our family, still is. And uh, very grateful for the Jackson family and their encouragement to us over these years and stuff as well. So we're grateful uh, to God for that opportunity. Um, and I will tell you, she married well, as near as we can tell. Joe's a fine young man. We like him. He loves the Lord. He's a fairly new believer, but growing like crazy in the Lord. And we're just really excited about uh, how God's got his hand on their marriage and on the ministry they're going to have in the days ahead. And uh, I, until that time, I had never heard of Arley. Until Kella came into our life, we'd never heard of Arley. And so this morning, uh, having only been down here for that one event, you know, I texted her this morning early and I said, okay, I'm going to preach at Meek tonight. What is, refresh my memory, what is the drive time to Arley? And of course, she texted me right back, told me about how long it would take me to get down here. And, uh, and so we were getting ready to turn off the highway. My dad's with me tonight, and uh, he's the guy you really ought to have down here, Brother Thomas. I'm telling you, dad's my hero in life and ministry. He's pastored in Mississippi for 48 years and retired and moved to Florence. I'd like to be near his son. It really was more about his grandkids than about us. But anyway, uh, he uh, moved to Florence and has been an interim pastor just almost continually since he moved there about eight, eight nine years ago. And so I'm very grateful that, um, that uh, to have mom and dad in the city. And it, they're actually members of my church. I'm grateful for that. I tell everybody he's the worst church member I've got. Uh, he only sends uh, my mother and his tithe. He's never there. Other than that, he's always preaching somewhere. But uh, God's had his hand on dad's ministry for a long time. I digress. He, he and I were coming down 157, and I called Kella because uh, I wanted to make sure I knew exactly where to turn. I called her, and before she ever said hello, she said, are you lost? I said, why would you jump to the immediate assumption that I'm lost? She said, well, every time I try to tell somebody I get to Arlen, they get lost. So anyway, but we made it here. She, she reminded me of what road and we made it here. Let me ask you tonight, take your Bibles and open them with me to uh, Acts chapter 13. Open them with me to the book of Acts chapter 13. And uh, your theme has been renewal. And I'll just tell you right up front, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not... Uh, a guy knock, notching my Bible cover and, and I'm, I'm not an entertainer, I'm a pastor. 
my heart beats for the church. I love the body of Christ. When I was a young preacher, still in seminary, I wasn't sure if God was going to lead me into the pastorate or, or was going to lead me to, to be an evangelist. I did a lot of revivals and a lot of preaching all over the place. But uh, over the years, the Lord really defined my sense of call to the church. I love the church. Uh, I, I love seeing God's people begin to rise up and be who God has created them and called them to be and to serve in ministry. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for every opportunity he's given me to do that. And so I, I'm, I'm just a pastor and I just believe God's word speaks to us. You don't need my wisdom. You don't need the wisdom of some book I read. You just need the wisdom of God's word. That's what all of us need. We need his word. And so tonight I want us to share together out of the first few verses of Acts chapter 13. Now your theme this week has been renewal. You've been talking about being renewed. Well, I want you to understand that what I want to share with you tonight has done as much to renew our church family and, and as much to stir the church in this generation as anything I know of. So if you found Acts chapter 13, stand with me, please. This is God's word. We want to read the first three verses of Acts chapter 13 together. The scripture says, now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Heavenly Father, tonight, would you speak to our heart? Lord, we, we just ask you, speak please, Father, to our heart. Speak to my heart. Speak to us through your word. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. God, don't let this moment be about us. Let it be about you. Renew us, challenge us, change us for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. When God wanted to expand, or wanted to spread the gospel around the world, he started a church, have you noticed that? He started the church and they started churches all over the known world of that day. And if you read the book of Acts, it just literally talks to you about the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem out to the ends of the earth. And, and over and over and over again, it talks about how churches sprang up in parts all over, in places all over that world. And so when God wanted to, to, to spread the gospel, when God wanted to fill the earth with his glory, he started a church, right? He raised up a whole lot of believers and then he put them together in, in community, in fellowships, in, in church families, and he left us with the single commission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make the name of Jesus Christ famous in this world. That's why we're here. And if you want to know how to do that, I can't think of a better guidebook than the Bible. We read a lot of different things that encourage us and strengthen us and teach us but at the end of the day, if the church wants to know how to be the church, the best place to look is in the Bible, right? And I can think of few places in the Bible better to look to help us understand a little bit of what the church is intended by God to be than those three verses we just read about the church at Antioch. Because this church at Antioch is a model for what all of us in the body of Christ need to be. Let me just see if I can set the stage for you tonight. On July the 4th, 1776, members of the Continental Congress lined up to sign the Declaration of Independence. The famous curtain line to that document says this, the, the, the big line in that document makes this statement. Listen, it says, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Those men understood the ramifications of that moment in their lives. Here's what they knew. They knew that from that moment on, they were marked men. You ever heard anybody say, is it, is it just me or is there an echo in here? 
hearing a little echo. Are you okay? If y'all are okay with that, I'm okay with that. But I'm hearing a little bounce here. All right. You've heard the expression, put your John Hancock right here. It comes out of that moment. John Hancock reached over to sign the Declaration of Independence and he signed it in really big letters. There was already a bounty from the King of England on his head. And here's what he said. He signed in enormous letters. He said, so that his majesty could now read his name without glasses and could now double the reward. That's what he said. Now here's what you need to understand about those men. They were willing to lay everything on the altar of freedom and we worship here tonight in peace and freedom because they were willing to be spent for the freedom of future generations. They said we are willing to be spent if necessary so freedom can rise on this earth. And I thought about that. And the question that kept coming up to me was what have we laid on the altar for the glory of God and the gospel. What have we laid on the altar for the glory of God and the gospel? Now you do understand what I mean when I say the gospel, don't you? The gospel is the story of God's work in our life. Here's what you need to understand about the gospel. The gospel teaches us that all of us are sinners and we're all separated from a holy God by our sin that our sin is an offense and an insult to a holy and righteous God. And that what every one of us, the best of us and the worst of us, the richest and the poorest, the most educated, the most uneducated, what all of us deserve is to die and spend eternity in hell enduring the wrath of God for all of eternity. That is what we deserve, every one of us. Not a one of us is exempt from that conversation. But we serve a great and mighty God who loved us too much to leave us in that condition. So he sent his son to be our savior. And his son lived a perfect life and died on the cross in my place. He bore the wrath of God for me. He endured the penalty and the punishment that should have been mine. He died the death I should have died. And when I am willing to turn away from my sin and place my trust in Christ and Christ alone, in that moment I become a newborn child of the living God and that is the heart of the gospel. That's the gospel, that's the gospel. And tonight we serve a God who wants every one of you here to know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. He loves you just like you are. He knows you where you are. He knows everything about you. He knows things you've never said to anybody. He knows things about you you do not even know about yourself. And knowing everything there is to know about you, he loves you. He loves you with a perfect love. And tonight the extent the, the gospel is extended to you tonight. And tonight you can turn away from your sin and everything else you're trusting in and place your trust in Christ and Christ alone. And in that moment, walk into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything more exciting. But the question tonight for the church is this. What have we laid on the altar so that other men and women, other boys and girls know that message of God's grace. What have we put on the altar for that? Let me ask you a question. Are we expendable? Are we an expendable church? Is Meek Baptist Church an expendable church for God's glory? Years ago when our Southern Baptist Convention was involved in the, in the controversy over the inerrancy of scripture, you remember those fun days. And uh, most of us have tried to quit thinking about them, but it was about a 25 year period where we just kind of had this, con this conflict going on for the soul of our denomination. And they established this thing called a peace committee, right? And they had people from both sides of the conversation and they put this great big peace committee together to try to find a way to reconcile the differences in the denomination. And Dr. Adrian Rogers, the retired and now late pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church was the elder statesman of the convention. He was on that committee. And I'll never forget what he said. He was telling the story about their committee meetings and they, both sides were standing their ground. And one of the guys looked at him and he said, Adrian, if you guys don't compromise on this, we'll never get together. 
And I love what Dr. Rogers said. We don't have to get together. He said, I don't have to pastor Bellevue. The Southern Baptist Convention does not have to survive. All we have to do is glorify God and preach the gospel to the nations. That's all we have to do. We don't have to get together because we make ourselves expendable for the glory of God and the gospel. Now, let me tell you that that does not mean that we are careless or reckless about our lives or the life of this church. We're not reckless or careless. That's not what this means. It does mean that we have one prayer we pray before the Father. God, whatever it takes to get the gospel out, we will do. Whatever it takes to get the gospel out, we'll do. It does mean we are yours, Lord. Spend us as you will for your glory and the gospel. Henry Martin said the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we must become. And there are people who say, which is most important in the church, evangelism or discipleship? I'll answer your question if you answer mine. Which is most important to you, breathing in or breathing out? Come on. You got to have both, right? We've got to engage in the work of evangelism so people will know the Savior we love. We're not here notching our cover. We're not here to build our roles. We get accused of that kind of stuff. But we exist for one reason, y'all. To see people who are far from God, disconnected from his people, and in need brought to the Savior. That's why we're here. But if we truly grow, if we truly are growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ, we will become more and more missionary minded. We will become more and more expendable for the gospel. We will become more and more like him. What did he do? What did he do? The Bible says in Philippians chapter two that he laid aside the garments of heaven and took on him the form of a man and became a servant and became obedient even unto death. Why did he do that? Because he loved us and he wanted to bring us to the Father. Now, if we wanna be like Christ, that has got to mean more than sitting in church and singing songs and raising our hands and being in a small group and studying Bible and going, I'm getting more and more Christ-like all the time. Are you? Because he put himself on a cross-shaped altar to bring you salvation. What have you put on the altar for the glory of God and the gospel? Now look back with me at Acts chapter 13, just for a minute. In, ja in verse one, it says, now there were at Antioch and, and they got to Antioch. Let me just tell you how this whole work began at Antioch. After Stephen was martyred in Jerusalem, a persecution arose in Jerusalem and many of the believers were scattered outside of Jerusalem. The apostles were not, they stayed, but many of, the, many of the believers were scattered outside Jerusalem and they went different places and everywhere they went, they preached the gospel. And some of them went to Antioch and God began to do a mighty work in Antioch. And so verse one tells us that there had, had congregated here at Antioch now in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, who you know was the missionary companion of Paul. And there were Simeon and Lucius and Menaean and Saul, the apostle Paul, they were there. And they were, verse two says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, they were seeking God. They were pouring their heart out, hearts out before God. They were worshiping him and they were preaching the word. Chapter 11 tells us about their preaching the gospel in Antioch. It tells us about it here. And they were doing church, right? They were just doing church. They were just doing what God called them to do. And God said this, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then when they'd fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now this church is a picture of what the church ought to be in this generation. So let me show you some things they knew. You write these things down, right? Because the dullest pencil remembers twice as much as the sharpest mind. Write these things down. An expendable church understands three things. An expendable church, a church that places itself at the, God's disposal for the gospel understands three things. They understand that God owns it all. God owns it all. Uh, we, we talk about ownership in the church and how, how a lot of people think this is ours 
and how we should take some sense of ownership because we want to be responsible for what God has entrusted to us. But at the end of the day, God owns everything. He owns this building. He owns the name. He owns you. He owns your home, your bank account, your retirement fund. He owns everything. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It all belongs to him. None of us become the stewards that God has called us to be until we understand God owns everything in our life. Here's the second thing they knew. They understood that because God owns it all, God can ask for whatever he wants. Are y'all okay? He owns it all, which means he can then turn around and ask for whatever he wants, right? You know, my kids, I always explain some things to them in terms that I hope they could understand. This is my house. You know, and, and kids will sometimes say to their parents, well, I need my privacy. I tell my kids, this is my house. You can have complete privacy when you live somewhere where your name's on the deed. Until then, I will snoop, I'll read what I want to, I'll go through what I want to, it's my house. My son's at college, right? He's at Auburn Montgomery playing baseball down there. And so, so the other day he calls me and he goes, uh, he goes, Dad, are you covering groceries while I'm down here? Am I covering groceries? You have a meal ticket that I paid for, right? I put money in your account. What do you mean and do I cover? Well, I had to go to Walmart last night and get some grocery items from my room and I just wondered if you're gonna put that money back in my account. Go to the cafeteria. You know, I, 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 it's all mine, right? I can take what I want to. Henry Blackaby said, when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, our lives become a thoroughfare where God can go and come at will and take whatever he wants to and do whatever he wants to. Because the moment I realize that we have one God and his son Jesus Christ died to redeem us and I surrender my life to him, it means I have decided he is God and I'm willing to surrender everything to him. That's what that's about. So they understood he owns it all. They understand he can ask for whatever he wants. And they understood that he deserves our best. He deserves our best. Look at verse, look at verse uh, two. And the Lord said this to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now let me ask you something. Without looking, without looking, do any of you don't look, Brother Thomas. He's cheating already. No, no, what I'm about to ask you is not up there. Anybody off the top of your head, without looking back, play fair, remember the names of those other people who were preaching and ministering? In verse one, I mean, you might come up with a couple of them because we just read it a minute ago, but you, hadn't, you don't know who any of them are, right? The two you know are Paul, and Barnabas. These guys were the two men that God used to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And, 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 and God said, send me your best. Give me the best ones that you've got. So God owns it all. He can ask for whatever he wants to, and he deserves our best. Let me tell you how God taught me this. God taught me this a couple of years ago. Our church... Uh, about three years ago, launched a second campus. And it, launching is a little bit of a strange term. What happened was there was another church that in the 1940s, our church had been used of God to launch a submission. And for, for the last 60 years, it had existed on its own, right? But about three years ago, it was almost dead. It was down to about 25 people and the youth group started somewhere around 66 years of age. They had no pastor, 
And we had been praying for God to open up a door of ministry for us to have a platform to serve some people in our city we don't normally touch, right? And this church was right in the middle of that. And I don't have time tonight. I, I tell people all the time, if you ever need two hours worth of God stories, I'll take you to lunch and just put them on you. Because God just, I mean, this was, a, this was an incredible God thing. Just every detail, one thing lined up right behind the other. Sammy Gilbert, our state evangelism director, says that it was the perfect storm. They'd never been more desperate. We'd never been more ready. And there'd never been more conversation about revitalizing struggling churches than there was right then. Perfect storm, right? And so we... In January, we voted to take this church on, to operate it as another campus. We're one church, two locations, really three count in our collegiate campus. So, so basically that's who we were, right? And so we, were, we, we made this, cast this vote as a church in January and we were gonna launch at Easter. Now that's quick, that is quick. And so one of the things we knew is we wanted to send some people from our congregation over there to help us get that work off the ground. But we didn't want to just stand up and go, hey, all y'all that want to go to Broadway and help us over there, stand up. You know, we wanted to make sure we had people who fit the ministry God was calling us to do over there. So we were going to invite them, right? And, and so we were praying, our staff, by we, I mean, at this point, our staff team, we were praying about who we needed to send over there. And we were just getting no, we were just getting no direction. I mean, it was just hard. It was one of those, we, we really wanted to pick a team leader first. And, and so it was just hard. And so one Sunday afternoon, and, and listen, I'm telling you, God by this point had lit our hearts on fire. We knew God was all over this work, right? And so we just began to pray. And, and, and one Sunday afternoon, I was at home and, and, and I, was, I was praying. Now, I'd like to tell you that it was more spiritual than it was. I'd like to tell you I was fasting and praying and praying. Lying in the presence of the Lord. I was just spending a Sunday afternoon at home, right? Watching a ball game, taking a nap. And I just, I'm sitting around there and I just got to pray. And I said, God, you know we're going to have to make some direction, on, get a direction going here very soon. And we just don't know who you want us to send over there. And God doesn't speak to me audibly, y'all. But this is about as close as he's ever gotten to audible. He said, what about Jim Trousdale? And this was my response. No, Lord, not Jim. I said, God, and Jim was one of the finest young laymen in our church. And I said, God, you know how important Jim Trousdale is to our main campus and what we're doing. And the Lord said, as surely as I'm sitting here, the Lord said, John, do you believe I'm in this enough to send your best? I said, okay, Lord, I'll call Jim. Now, let me tell you the rest of the story. I called, we had, I called Jim, had lunch with him. You and Kay prayed about going and doing this. Give me two weeks. He prayed about it, came back. Yeah, we'll go. And uh, he's a typical salesman. He put some conditions on it. Yeah, we'll go, but you got to get me. And he named another couple in our church to go with me. So we began to put that team together and God's done a mighty work on that campus. And several months later, listen to this, we put Jim Trousel on our staff as our Broadway campus pastor. He's still part-time because God said, it's mine and I can ask you for whatever I want and I deserve your best. I deserve your best. And sometimes the cost of the gospel goes up, right? I mean, I got just a little bit of a taste of that a couple of years ago when I put my daughter, who was still a college student, on a plane in Birmingham, Alabama to send her to do an internship with a mission, uh, with a, uh, a partnership church we have in Botswana in Southern Africa. And I got just a little taste of that. But I've known people who put their kids on planes to send them halfway around the world to invest their lives for the glory of God and the gospel, not knowing when they would see them again. And I knew mine was coming back in four weeks. I got a little taste of that. So let me ask you again. God owns it all. He can ask for whatever he wants. He deserves our best. Let me ask you again. Are we expendable? Have you said to God, God, whatever you want from my life, I will do. 
Have you said that? For some of you tonight, that might mean you surrender your life to him for salvation and let him save you and begin a relationship with you you've never known before. For some of you, it might be the same thing I had to say to God when I was uh, about a senior in high school and God began to stir in my heart to call me to ministry. I had to say, God, anywhere, anytime to do anything. Have you said that to him? Or, or have you put parameters on it? Have you said to God, no God, not that. No God, not there. No God, not now. What have you built parameters around and said, God, you can have anything in my life but this. What is a church? Have you put parameters around and God, for the glory of God and the gospel, you can have anything Meek Baptist Church has but? Are we an expendable church? So let me, let me just walk you to the end here by asking you some questions, all right? Everybody hates it when preachers get from the theoretical to the practical. I think you, what you call that is he's quit preaching and gone to meddling. So let me ask you something. Have you put your personal preferences on the altar. Have you put your personal preferences on the altar? Now we've all got personal preferences. We've all got things that we would like to see done and if the world would just do it my way, everything would be fixed, right? I mean, you, you come on, don't look at me so, so spiritual. You could feel the same way. If they just do it what way I'm telling them to, it would all be okay. Most of that is not biblical conviction, it's personal preference. Now the church at Antioch did that. You say, how do you get that out of three verses? I don't get that out of just three verses. I have to go back to chapter 11. Because if you go back in, in Acts chapter 11 and you read where the first people began to, first believers began to make their way into Antioch and they started preaching the gospel. You know who they started preaching the gospel to? They started pe preaching the gospel to people who were just like them. But then there came a day when the Holy Spirit of God began to push them out of the nest and said, you gotta go talk to people who are not like you. I will never forget sitting in a meeting with a group of our leaders from our church one day and we were looking at launching a ministry several years ago called Celebrate Recovery. And, and if you know anything about Celebrate Recovery, it's a ministry to people who who are hurting and have some pretty bad habits in their life and some serious hangups, right? And so in this meeting, somebody said no. We've got to make sure we can love those people. And my youth pastor stood up and he said, we gotta face the fact we are those people. We are those people. And so sometimes we wanna preach the gospel to people that look like us, smell like us, talk like us, act like us. But you gotta be willing to get past personal preference. So have you put your personal preferences on the altar? What is that? What are those personal preferences? I'm gonna quit preaching and go to meddling. You just understand, Brother Thomas told me, he told you a minute ago, he and I never, didn't know each other. We'd met once at Keller's wedding and once at an evangelism event, but so don't blame him for this. Musical styles. <gasps> you know what Spurgeon called his music ministry back in ancient London? The war department. What about the classroom that you meet in? No, can't move mine. What about that line item you wish was still in the budget? Hmm. Okay. Do you get the point? See, before a holy God, he did not call us into this church or my church or any church to guard our personal preferences. We have two objectives, the glory of God and the proclamation of the gospel. We sacrifice everything on those two altars, personal preferences. And, and, and listen, hey, my church hadn't gotten past all of this either, I promise you. Because when we started dropping the coats and ties, I got, roughed up a little about that. 
I walked up to a guy one day and he's standing there in his tie and I'd already sized him up as I walked up to him. He said, I think it's terrible that we're not wearing ties in this church anymore. I just looked at him, called him by name and I said, a man with Disney characters on his tie has no moral authority to lecture me about not wearing them. <laughs> he never brought it up again. He said, I guess you have a point. You know, I had, I had one, I have one older lady who, when I would wear, when I wear a tie, she walks up to me, she goes, you look so good today, brother John. I said, I thought I looked pretty good last week. Didn't you? You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. I do. So we're not passing either, but, but we've got to come to the place where we put personal preferences on the altar, right? Secondly, have you put your resources on the altar? They did. In Acts chapter 11, it tells us that the grace of God made givers out of them and that they willingly gave to support suffering brothers and sisters in Christ. They were willing to put their resources on the altar. Now, resources are more than money, obviously. It's energy and it's time and it's talent and it's treasure. It is resources. It is, it is your young people. It's, it's the resources that God has placed at your disposal. Are you willing to put those things on the altar and say, God, whatever it takes for God to be glorified and the gospel to be spread, that's what we're willing to do. How about your character and your conduct? They did. They did. Acts chapter 11 says that their likeness to Christ was noticed by the world. Do you remember what it said, what, what it said in, the, in the book of, in, the, in Acts chapter 11? Do you remember what it said about them? It said the believers were called Christians first at Antioch. And just for the record, it was not said as a compliment. But they noticed that they were different and they were distinctive and they called them Christians, people like Christ, little Christ. And, and, and so they, they had a character about them and a conduct about them that made people notice. It's important for us to make sure that our character and our conduct does not shoot our message in the foot. Quickly. Have you put your attention to the word of God and time in his presence on the altar? In other words, they did, and Acts 13 says they took the teaching and preaching of the word of God very seriously. They took that seriously. And it says that they engaged God personally in the disciplines of prayer and fasting. They did. They took that seriously. Have you? So I'm going to tell you something. Listen, the greatest, if, if you want to be a growing follower of Jesus Christ, you need time in his word and time in prayer. You, you got to have that. That's got to be your, the oxygen of your soul, right? I mean, I mean, you say, and I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, you're a pastor. You prepare to preach. It's easy for you to stay in the Word. Let me tell you something. A man sitting right over there taught me early in my life a commitment to the Word of God. And yes, I get to spend a lot of my days preparing to preach the Word. But I try to make sure that early in the morning I carve out time just to spend with Jesus for me. Just to spend with Him for me. Just to feed my soul, right? Now, I wish I could tell you I had always been good about that. But God, by his grace, has taught me that there are few things that are going to make any bigger difference in my life than time in the world. I've told my congregation this. They'll tell you. I've told them this over and over and over again. If all you get of the word of God when you come in this church building, I don't care if Brother Thomas preaches the best sermon since Peter at Pentecost. And your Sunday school teacher is the best Sunday school teacher in the world. If that's all you're getting, and they're the best, I'm telling you, you're spiritually malnourished. You're undernourished. Pick up the word, read the word, spend time in prayer. Are you willing to say, God, because I want the gospel to get out, God, because I want your glory to reign, because I want the name of Jesus to be famous, I'm going to spend time in your word and time in prayer so you can speak to me about what that means in my life.
on May 8, 1886, Dr. John Pemberton and Jacob's Pharmacy in Atlanta created a sweet and syrupy drink for five cents a glass. Today, Coca-Cola is all over the world. I was in Nicaragua on a mission trip. And the missionary down there, we'd gone out, I'd been teaching pastors that day, and we'd gone out after that, that morning session with those pastors to one of the villages, and we'd worked out there, and we were riding around, he showed me some of the other villages where they had work. He said, uh, you want a Coke? I said, yes, that would be great. He said, great, right up here in just a minute, we're gonna get you a Coke in a bag. I said, excuse me, a Coke in what? No lie, we stopped at a little roadside stand. He bought Coke, Coca-Cola. I wanna make sure we're clear on this. Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola in a little Ziploc baggie and they snipped the corner out of it and we drank it out of that corner. And I'm riding down the road and I'm going, I don't know if I want all this or not, you know. He hands his out to car window to a kid standing on the side of the road. And so when we passed the next kid, I handed mine out in. But it's everywhere, why? Because there was a determination and a commitment on the part of the Coca-Cola bottling company to make that brand known all over the world. And we are the bride of Christ. We are the church of the living God. And we must have that same determination and that same commitment to making the name of Jesus Christ famous around the world and right here in Arlington. I read a story about a bridge that was built across Panther Creek in Western Kentucky. It was built by the United States government. Because of that, the rest of the story won't surprise you. It was a source of pride and a symbol of recovery. But today, years later, they say the bridge looks as new as the day in which it was built because there is no road leading to it or from it. And the author of the article that I read about that bridge in Panther, Kentucky, or Panther Creek, said a bridge that doesn't carry traffic is a bridge in name only. And a church that doesn't carry the gospel is a church in name only. Let me ask you one more time. Are we expendable? Years ago, I'd spent a week when my family and I lived in Arkansas for almost seven years. We're from Mississippi and we went to Arkansas for almost seven years before we moved to Alabama. And uh, there was a week that I had just blocked out and I spent time in a Christian retreat center about an hour and a half from where I lived, just studying, just praying and writing sermons and, and just seeking God for my church family. And, and um, that Friday morning, I got ready to go home and my cell phone rang while I was loading the car. My wife said, are you coming straight home? And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm heading that way in just a few minutes, but I was planning on stopping by the bookstore in Little Rock for a few minutes and a couple things there, and I, I was coming on home. She said, no, you need to come straight home. And I said, why? What in the world? Why do I need to come straight home? She started crying, and she said, honey, Stephen has been in an accident. I said, how bad is it? She said, I don't know. I'll call you back as soon as I know. Stephen was a young man who had been on my staff in Mississippi as a youth pastor for a few years. And when he finished college, he went off to seminary and served somewhere else. And I had recommended him to his first church to pastor outside of the city where we lived. And uh, he and I were like brothers almost. He was like a, little bro like a little brother. I have a little sister, but Stephen was like a little brother to me. We were together all the time. And I got about 10 miles down the road and my wife called me back and she said, honey, Stephen didn't make it. That morning on his way to his church for early morning prayer time with his minister of music, another car, probably under the influence of drugs, crossed the center line, hit Stephen head on, he died on the highway. 
until that day, the only people I had ever lost in my life were grandparents that I loved with all my heart, but they lived to ripe old ages and died at the right time of life and went home to be with the Lord Jesus. This was the first time my life had ever been rocked by that kind of tragedy. About an hour after that phone call, I walked into that house to see Stephen's young wife, two small children. And Christine hugged me and she said, I need you to do the funeral. Now let me give you, let me give you a little bit of the good news because people always want to know. At his funeral, the day we had his funeral, I preached the gospel and we had seven or eight people gave their life to Christ at Stephen's funeral. I mean, y'all come forward invitation at the end of a funeral. And one week to the day after we carried him back to North Mississippi and buried him, I had the opportunity to lead his younger brother to faith in Jesus Christ over the telephone. And his father, who had been a salesman, who had probably missed a calling many years before in life and bounced around from job to job because he didn't answer the call of God when he should have, is now a pastor in North Mississippi. Those were some of the hardest days of my life. And the Lord reminded me of something. I heard Dr. Johnny Hunt years ago make this statement. He said, we have all of eternity to enjoy our victories and only one lifetime to win them. And in those days of Stephen's death, the Lord impressed in my heart that what we're going to do for the Lord, we better do today. It's a parable in the Bible. Jesus tells a parable about a man who went off on a long journey, called his servants in, and he gave them each some of his money to invest. Do you remember that? He gave the first one the most, and then it stepped down to the last one. He just gave him one talent, and he came back from his journey, and the first two had made more with what he gave them, and he got to the last guy, and the last guy said, I was afraid because I knew you were a hard man. You reap where you do not sow, and so I hid your money in the ground so you'd have it back with me. So so you'd have it back. And the man said, if you knew all that about me, shouldn't you have at least put it to the banker so when it came back, I would have it with interest. If If you look at that parable, the only one of those men who was ever chastised by the master was the one who did nothing. Did the others risk losing the master's money? Yeah. But the only one that got the rebuke of the master is the one who did nothing. And I made up my mind that I might stand before God one day and say I tried a lot of things and failed. But I made up my mind I would not stand before him and say, God, I was scared. It didn't fit my personal preferences, whatever the case might be. And I did nothing with what you gave me. Are we expendable for the glory of God and the gospel? Would you bow with me? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed in this room. I'm going to ask you to please be very still and very quiet. Brother Thomas is going to make his way right down here. And tonight, there might be someone in this room who does not know for sure that you have eternal life and that you're going to go to heaven when you die. We pray, God forbid, that anything would ever happen to you in an untimely way. But you are not guaranteed one more breath. And when you draw that last breath, having made your decision to accept or reject Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that is the end of your opportunity. So tonight, if you've never surrendered your life to God and come to know him through faith in his son Jesus Christ I ask you to call on his name and right where you're sitting ask him Lord Jesus save me Lord I know I'm a sinner and I know you died on the cross for my sin and right now I surrender my life to you save me and change me Lord Jesus and some of you know that's the decision you need to make Because from the moment you walked in here tonight and we began to sing about the Lord and we began to talk about the Lord, there's been an uneasiness in your spirit. There's been a stirring in your spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you to himself tonight. And if you're going to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, it needs to be tonight. So call on him and ask him to save you. 
And if you need somebody to talk about that, I'm gonna ask you to come and tell Brother Thomas that he would love to talk with you. I'm sure there are other people here who would share with you as well. If you prayed right now and said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. When we stand to our feet in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to step out in the nearest aisle very quickly and come and take Brother Thomas by the hand. He's not gonna embarrass you or humiliate you. He just wants to celebrate that with you. And wants to help you know what happens next because this is not the end, it's the beginning of a brand new life with Christ Jesus. But tonight the message has largely been to the church. So church, are you expendable? As an individual, have you said to God, God, whatever it takes for my life to glorify you and get the gospel out, I will do. Tonight, I'm gonna to ask you to come and just fill up this, around this altar right here and just pray and do business with God and just call on God and say, God, I want my life to count. I want my life to be expendable. I wanna do what it takes for you to get glory through my life. If anything will renew you as a follower of Jesus Christ, it will be because you make a decision to give yourself away for Jesus Christ and his glory. We've watched that renew our, our church family very much over these last days. Some of you might need to come and join this church and tell Brother Thomas you want to become part of this church family. Some of you may say, we need to get together and pray together as a church. God would make us expendable. Some of you may want to come together and just get on your knees before a holy God and say, God, make me Baptist Church an expendable church for the gospel and the glory of God. So I'm going to ask you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody moving around right now unless you're coming this way. I'm going to ask you to stand very quietly, very reverently to your feet. Just stand all over this congregation. Everybody stand to your feet. Heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, move in this moment. Holy Spirit of the living God, have your way in us. Do a work in us, God, that can only be explained by your Spirit. Lord, right now, let somebody give their heart to Jesus. Let some believer get serious about being a Christ follower. Let somebody tonight be willing to surrender their church family to you for your glory. Make us expendable, Lord. As he plays and sings this song, Brother Thomas is waiting on you. Step out and come right now.